Can I break down what I play in uh, in Pictures of Home? Yeah. Uh, the intro of Pictures of Home basically is uh, triplets, which are one of uh, the drum fraternity's great, great built-in tricks. Uh, triplets allow you to play uh, quite fast without having to work too hard. Whether you're doing them all with your the triplets with your hands or between your hands and your legs. The nice thing with Pictures of Home, the intro to that, is that the drum fill is in a relative speed to the track. So it's, 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 it's like a conjurer tries to do, it tries to misdirect you with the speed of his hand. What I try to do is to confuse you with where the one is when the music comes in. It all makes total sense once you get used to it, but the first time you hear it, you go, well, how does that work? And so the drum fill is basically working on the premise of three beats against two, where you've got uh, the pulse going, there's your pulse of the beat. I will be thinking, I'll be thinking a waltz against it. So I'm playing that, but I know exactly where the wand's going to come in when the music comes in. I'll show you what I mean. Most of the things I've done that people like, it's not because they're difficult, it's because they're, they're effective. They work in the context of the piece of music they're going to, to service. And you have to remember, that's, that's the most important thing. To be a drummer is okay. It's sort of more important to be a musician, regardless of all the jokes, you know. Um, yeah, and we, we drummers have to put up with a lot of jokes, you know, we're, we're the sort of brunt of it, we, we get everything. But I, I have a, like a reality check for every, every other musician. How many people here have ever been in and worked in recording studios? A few? Yeah. Well, you know, the glory in a studio is that <coughs> you can isolate what everybody does. And so, you know, you hear this mix and it sounds great. You just need one guy to have a dig at the drummer. Well, I didn't, that didn't feel so good. So what I do is I just take all the drum faders down and you just leave the cacophony that's left. <laughs> you want to hear people playing out of time? Well, guitarists, bass players, keyboard players, they're all over the place. You bring the drums back in and it all makes total sense. <laughs> it's the ultimate get back. You know? We don't get many chances, but when we get one, we stick it to them. <laughs> I mean, I got my first drum kit at 15. I was in a band, a local band at 15 and three months, and at 17 I was on the road in a professional band, and at 19 I was in Deep Purple. Everything happened so very, very quickly, and I was full of myself. You know, I, I, there's nothing I couldn't do until I tried it. And uh, I, because of that, I used to do everything all the time. And uh, when you get it right, it's fantastic. And when you get it wrong, it's not. Um, and what happens is you actually learn that some of the things you really, really appreciate in other drummers and things that turn you on sometimes aren't those incredibly um, immediate things. You start listening to grooves and you think, hey, that, if he played anything there, it would be totally wrong. He's got it so right the way it feels, you don't want to interrupt that. So it's a learning process. And it's one that some people say, well, why don't you still play like that? The reason is I can't. I'm a different person. I don't think the same way anymore. Physically, it's easy enough to do. You just keep battering something, and if you miss something, you hit something else. You know, um, just keep flapping around the kit. You, 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 keep, you keep something going. But when you learn that the groove is as important as being the guy that people look at on stage, you start trying to find the groove. And that's a lot easier for the other musicians to play with, believe me. And also, music styles change. So, you know, um, if you're playing something which has a more, um, needs a more controlled feel, then you just can't be Keith Moon or Buddy Rich. You just can't be doing that. Sometimes you have to be John Bonham. Sometimes you have to be Simon Kirk. You have to sit on it and keep it. 
And uh, yeah, things do change. And I look back at pictures of me when I was playing when I was 20, and I go, Christ, you know? <laughs> not, not how did I do it, I'm saying why did I do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so it's a very, very astute observation, but one that I'm not ashamed of. I, 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 the longer you do things, hopefully the better you get at it, and the more you learn about it. And uh, I still have the ability to put a bit of nuts, you know, craziness in a, in a tune if I want to do it. But I, still, I have a lot of fun not doing it now, where as a kid I, I couldn't see the point of not doing anything. I can't choreograph a drum solo because it's, it's all dependent on how I feel on the night. Uh, people say, you know, go on, play the mule, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't have done it the night afterwards. I could have given you something else, but I couldn't do the same thing. Most drummers, when they're doing, doing a solo, they have little, little signposts. You know, I'm going to start here, and I have these four or five places I want to go. I might not go to them in the same, same order. I might not take a straight line. But these are little tricks I want to get in, and I'll get there somehow. You know? But uh, drums are an acoustic instrument, and you are you're in the lap of the gods when it comes to sound. Some, some rooms are incredibly helpful, and everything you try is easy, so it comes off. Some rooms are not drum-friendly. Drum and everything you do sounds stilted and hard. And because of that, you don't play the same way. You might try to play too hard, or you, you just feel you're tens, tensing up because you're not enjoying it. So you can go one night in a great room feeling bad and do a great solo. The next night you'd be in an awful room. And you know it, it changes every time you do it. And you can never guarantee what's going to happen. Until you get into that precise moment on the stage where, you, where you're trying to create something from nothing. So uh, it's hit or miss. And uh, there are guys who are technically adept, and they can actually just say, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And it makes no difference to them where they're playing. I, I revere that. That's great. I can't do it. But what I can do is I, occasionally I can come out with the, the, the odd quirky thing because I don't know what's going to happen next. And it takes me by surprise as well. And if, when that does happen, it gives you another, another little road to go on, and you see how far it'll go and see what else you can do with it. Um, but I, I, I have no choice in it, that's the only way I can do it. I've been lucky to play with really good musicians, and they are all different. And what, what happens is, when, you, when you're blending drummer and bass player, when you're locking together, the chemistry changes because, you know, 50% of it changes either, when, you, when you change the bass player. And the way they play influences the way the drummer plays. Um, when I play with Roger in Deep Purple, Roger plays very, very solid, uh, simple bass, bass parts. He gives me room to do things if I want to. When Glenn Hughes was in the band, Glenn is a much more complex bass player. And because he plays more, I have to play less. There's only 100% of what you can do, and somebody's taking up 50, you could, you've only got 50 as well. You can't, you got, can't overclutter it. And when, when we're in White State with Neil, Neil was a wonderful field bass player. Again, a little more room for me to do things if I wanted to. There's no better, there's no, there's no second best. I mean, McCartney is a superb bass player, and he plays absolutely nothing. You know, if you're playing a rock and roll tune, he's playing almost country and western two to the bar. But it doesn't feel country and western, it feels like rock and roll. So that, you know, I've been lucky. If you're playing with good musicians, they all bring something different to the table and they, they're just it's interesting and, and it's exciting to to find yourself changing because that's the only way it can work there is only one possibility when that's the when that's the blend when you find a, a new 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 pal to play with it's quite fun you know have you ever had a howler pardon have you ever had a howler of a gig oh yeah um <clears throat> I've had loads. <laughs> yeah. It's not me personally, I blame everybody else on stage. You know, the guitar was too loud, the bass player was too quiet. Uh, vocals were standing in the wrong place. <laughs> um, you have nights where everything goes wrong. You know, usually the first thing that can destroy a nice, you hit the snare drum, the head breaks. That's a real good start, you know. 
you, you can't actually do much without a snare drum and you know, you, you're eight bars into the first song and you, you're frantic looking around for something else to hit for the offbeat that, that people can hear. <coughs> Usually it's equipment breakages that do it. <coughs> Excuse me. Bass drum pedals flying out a good, uh, that's great as well, you know, you end up sort of hitting nothing. Yeah, it does put you off a bit. Um, I've never had a gig where I, it was bad because I played badly. I've had gigs where I wasn't thrilled with myself, you know. But uh, usually it's just stuff breaking down, you know. And, and music is very complex nowadays. It's not a matter of just putting an instrument and playing it. You've got all this electronic crap everywhere. And uh, if electronic crap can go wrong, it will. You know, it, it, it's just one of the, the laws of uh, electronics that it will break, and it will always break at the worst time. Um, so those gigs are very, very hard, and you know, you actually you don't do this, but you're actually counting the minutes till you can get off and get to the bar because it's just one of you, you want to forget it all. Yeah. Anything that is impossible, it is impossible. You know, it's like you see conjurers walking through brick walls. You know they didn't do it. <clears throat> this is impossible, but I sh I can do it. Okay. Every note you see is a downstroke. But it is a combination of three things. It's technique, it's power, and it's knowing the trick. And I'm not going to tell you how to do it. <laughs> right, so here we go. But it does hurt. <laughs> it's good, but it's not quite as clever, I don't think. I don't think I can quite get the finger thing right. That's about it for that one. <laughs> I once, when I was a, 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 a real young kid, just started, I saw a, a, a TV show, Buddy Rich playing with his band, and he did it. And it was so far beyond anything I could comprehend other than with my mouth dropping open that I totally forgot about it. And then about five years ago, I was uh, asked to do the Modern Drummer Festival in New York, and there was a fabulous uh, younger player there by the name of Mike Mangini. And he'd brought it back out in the open again. And after a couple of drinks and watching him very carefully, I sort of managed to get all the information I needed on it. And so I practiced it. But Mike uses it in, in his solo as just a little, a little additive. I thought if I was going to use it, I'd try and make a, a power thing out of it. And when I stop, it's because I have to. The pressure on this index finger to get that, that bounce is it's, it's actually it's actually painful. So when I stop, that's 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 as many notes as I can give you. Then it's it's like a recuperation period then, you know. But it's a wonderful trick, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I still won't tell you how I do it. Okay. <laughs> Steve only does two things: he flies airplanes and he plays guitar. And that's it. That's. I mean, he's a really bright guy. I mean, really super, super high IQ. But that's what he knows about. You know, you talk to somebody else and it's like, well, nothing. <laughs> yeah. You ask him about a propeller, he'll tell you everything about a propeller, from which plane, what year, who made it. By, by the time you stop yawning, you know. <laughs> and so he just flies planes and he plays guitar and he loves them both. And you know, his enthusiasm is, is really focused. Really has a good time. Because material's fresh. Oh yeah, well, he's a fountain of ideas. When we go in the studio, um, when we start to record, uh, we we don't have uh, like a Phil Collins or a Paul McCartney or a George Gershwin or a Cole. We don't have a fixed song. We create pieces of music which become songs. And Steve and I generally 
get in early and start messing around together and one thing will lead to another but I just have to push him in a direction musically and he'll come up with an idea you know it's, it's, it's uh, so refreshing when you can just go and every day you find a new thing to play because he's, he just doesn't stop that's, that's what he does oh Chad's a great guy far too tall for a drummer he's much too tall <laughs> drummers are my height this is the perfect height for a drummer um, Chad's a great guy. He, he's uh, he comes he comes off like a big goofus, you know, but he really isn't. He's a very smart man, and uh, he's a lot of fun. Everything's a laugh with Chad, and he's a far better drummer than most people know. Just because he just plays grooves with the peppers, you know, people think that's all there is. But he's uh, he's he's a hot merchant. He uh, he enjoys his playing as well. Um, he's he's the my most recent friend. In the drumming fraternity, he's the guy I've m met most recently, and uh, one, of the, one of the few guys that I actually do get on with really, really well. Um, he's a monster, though. You know, I, 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 I don't think I'd like to go out clubbing with him. I think I think those days are far behind me, and he's 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 coming. He's go, he's going up the hill, enjoying it. I've been there, and I've come down it. Um, but he's a great guy and uh, good friend. The reason I got some drums is because we had no furniture left. <laughs> my father, my mother and father realized that everything we had had great big sort of stick holes in it and great marks and lacerations across because I was, I'd go find a big pair of knitting needles in my mum's basket and just be whacking the crap out of all this stuff. And if you've got no drums, you want to got furniture. So my old man realized that I was sort of um, hooked on it. So I got my first kit. Uh, to me, it was, uh, it was easy. I don't mean that in a flash way. I understood why a drum kit works the way it works instantly. I knew why the offbeat was where it was, and I knew why the lead on the on the cymbal was. I knew where the bass drum beat should be. Um, I was speaking to Gary Moore about this uh, when I played with him 20 odd years ago, and he said he felt the same thing when he picked up a guitar. He he sort of instinctively knew why the chord shapes were, were the way they were. And I think sometimes nature gives certain people uh, an insight, and it's, it's, it's a big advantage. It saves you a couple of years, and it gives you that, um, that kickstart that most people who don't have that have to learn. You know? And for me, it was just a very logical thing. I understood how to do it, and within a very short period of time, I could do it well enough that people were enjoying it. So I, it, wasn't, it wasn't even a conscious thought for me to do anything else. The only time I ever had another job was just because I had to pay off money on the drums that I bought, which I couldn't afford. Uh, it was always the moment I was old enough to sort of not even make a decision. I don't think I was really old enough to think in that sort of a term, but that's all I wanted to do. Uh, it's almost like I had no choice in the matter. Thank God. <laughs> Thanks. Who was your drumming idol? Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, well, the first people I saw drumming were... All the, all the old big band guys in the 30s and 40s on those Hollywood movies that we used to get on a Sunday afternoon when there was nothing else on. Um, and I didn't really want to be the drummer, but there was one guy. His name was Gene Krupa. And he was just the monster drummer of the 30s. The monster white drummer of the 30s. Let's get that right. And I didn't want to be a drummer. I just wanted to look like him because he looked cool. He was a great looking guy and it, he was made into the big star and they used to have the cameras positioned underneath the drums and they'd be shooting him and he'd be playing on the drums and it, it just looked fantastic. Somebody get a matchbox out and he'd be playing on the matchbox. You know, he's a big star. Then I started to listen. I started to listen to what he was doing and, and the sound was so wonderful. That I, tried to, I tried to copy him. Like you teach a parrot to say pretty boy, you know, I said, well that goes there. And yeah, I understand. That's good. Hey, look at me, I'm Gene Cooper. And that's, that's where it took off from. And then, of course, you start watching and listening to other guys, and you start taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of that. And what you, whatever you can't do correctly, you change into a form that you can do. And so if you keep taking from enough places with a big enough variety, and you, you start developing your own style. It's when you, when you just take from one or two places, you start to sound derivative and like too many other people playing the same sort of thing. So I thank God that when I was a little boy still messing around on the floor, the musical influence I had were big band swing, they weren't rock and roll. 
I picked up on rock and roll very quick, but I picked up on it second. So I, I have that extra, uh, extra bit of ammunition in my arsenal to, to spread what I do. My favorite modern player. Um, that's very difficult. And you know why it's difficult? Because they don't hang around long enough for you to learn enough about them. Um, most groups and bands that come now, they're here for two or three years. They make one or two records and they disappear. And it's very, very hard to actually learn enough about young players to, to get a, an idea about what, what, they exactly, what, what they are exactly. Um, so by the time you try and find out who the hell played that wonderful drum fill on a record, the band has disbanded. You never hear the drummer again, or any of the other guys. And uh, you sort of move on to the next thing. Uh, and I do have a big problem with what's going on in music today. Um, and it's not that there aren't some great players. There are some fabulous young players. The trouble is, I don't know who's playing. I can't pick out personalities. I can't pick out different sounds. I can't pick out different styles. I used to know when it was Ginger Baker. I used to know when it was Mitch Mitchell. I certainly knew when it was John Bonham. I knew when it was Buddy Rich. I knew when it was June Krupa. They all had things that were totally unique to them. At the moment, everything is starting to sound the same. And it drives me nuts because I want to know the person playing. I don't, I don't care how good they are. I just want to know what's the character behind it. If you know the person, you know, you know why they play like they do. And you see the differences in what they do. And you see the different sounds, the different idea they have of what a drum kit should be. At the moment, everything is just so samey and so clinical. But I, honestly, I just lose interest. I shouldn't, but I do. There's nothing I can do about it, because I, I want to know the person, and I can't, I can't find the person there. So thank you for the question, but I really can't answer it. Because you youngsters don't hang around long enough for me to learn about you.